In this screencast, we're going to explore depth first search of graphs. And in this series of screencasts, we're working our way up the northwestern Hawaiian Islands on two expeditions that I was on board. We visited this island and the next one in the series, Moku Mana Mana, on the teacher expedition in 2005, twice actually. And it just so happens that here we were shown how to explore in depth. This is using a CTD or conductivity temperature and depth device to measure the, uh, those characteristics of ocean water at various depths. And we're also shown how the ship at night does mapping of the ocean depths in this mapping room. So we saw in the previous screencast the comparison of depth first and breadth first search where breadth first is using a queue-like protocol and depth first is using a stack-like protocol and that's where you get the depth. For example, we saw how if you start at this node here and you happen to explore this neighbor first, you're going to just keep going. In this particular example, discovering the entire graph before you even check out these two neighbors here which turn out to be already explored by the time you get to them. Whereas breadth first would have explored each of those three neighbors first because it visits nodes in the order of the distance from the start node. One other big difference between depth first and breadth first search is that breadth first search as presented in this material, this is not necessarily true for it, but as we presented it, you would start from one start vertex and it would be possible to not reach all the vertices in the graph. For example, if, uh, I'll do this in blue actually, if in the graph these two links were going that way, this node would never be discovered, and so its distance would remain infinite. Whereas depth first search, after we run a search from a particular start node, we're going to check wh whether we can do search from all the other nodes. And so if there's any node like this one that hasn't been explored yet, then we will do a search from that as well. And as a consequence of that, whereas breadth first search constructed a single tree in the graph, depth first search is going to construct a forest of trees. And that's going to be called the depth first forest. So as you may recall, a forest of trees is really just a set of trees. Uh, they're disjoint from each other. And we'll see uh, many examples of that later. Uh, both breadth first and depth first have the attribute v dot pi for each vertex what's its parent. For example, over here x dot pi would be the t because we got to x from t. And so these parent pointers are what allow us to reconstruct the tree by tracing backwards. Now breadth first search also had a v dot d which was for distance from the start node. Here that's going to have a different meaning so we're going to get back to that into a second. Uh, now both of these algorithms have three colors that they, they uh, color the nodes. They color them white, which means they're undiscovered. And we color them gray, which means that they're discovered, but not finished. And we color them black, which means we have finished with, it, with them. Now here's where we have some different attributes that are used in depth first search. Depth first search is going to give every node an attribute v dot d and v dot f. This will be the time, quote unquote, at which the vertex was discovered. So v dot d is assigned to a vertex at the time tick, we'll de define what those are, time ticks are later, when the node, uh, node or, I use node and vertex interchangeably, uh, when the vertex goes from white to gray. And it's going to set the attribute v dot f for when the vertex goes from gray to black. So v dot d is the moment that it's discovered, v dot f is the moment that it's finished. And it turns out that these numbers are going to give us very important properties about the structure of the graphs. But we'll get back to that after we look at the code. Here's a pseudocode for DFS. And let's start by comparing it to the uh, breadth first search. DFS only needs a single procedure because it's just going to start its search from a single node and find what it can find from there. DFS, we're going to try to guarantee that we find, or we are going to guarantee that we find every vertex in the graph, so we're going to run a loop over all the vertices. 
Um, so we need two procedures, one to do this, the initial setup that's only done once, and one to do the recursive visiting. But there's a strong correspondence between the two otherwise. So here's the initialization we did in, in BFS to set up the initial color of the vertices being white and uh, them not having any parents. And we see the same thing here. Uh, the, we don't have the distance thing because we're going to handle that differently. And then the correspondence continues down here in the, uh, the loop. You know, we look at each vertex adjacent to where we are now, each same thing here. And if it's white, uh, then we're going to set the parent. But we just found it from there. And uh, here we end queue because we're trying to do FIFO. Here we're going to do a recursive call because a recursive call uses the recursion runtime stack, so we get stack-like behavior. And then when we're done with that, the, visiting the neighbors of U, we mark it black to indicate we're done in both cases. So that's the correspondence. So now let's look at DFS by itself. So again, we start, we just give it just a graph, no start node. We do the initialization. Everything is initially unvisited and has no parent. And time will be a simple integer. We start with the integer time of 0. And then we're going to uh, check each vertex in the graph, starting a search from the first one we find. And when that returns, we'll go on to the next vertex and see if it was found. Because it may have been found during this recursive call here. And so whether or not it's white will tell us whether it has not been visited yet. Then the recursive procedure. There is a symmetry here in that every time we visit a node, we increment the time, record that time either as a discovery in market gray or as a finishing in market black. So time is incremented when a node is entered and when a node is exited. And time starts at 0. And for that reason, the time is going to run, well, we start at 0, but we increment it before we use it. So it's going to run from 1 to 2 times the set of the number of vertices. Each vertex will be first discovered and then finished exactly once. And that will cause the, the time to be incremented for the discovery change, the, the color change for gray, and the finishing, the color change for black. And also, this is going to be the case that b dot d is always less than uh, v dot f. So each call to the DFS visit is starting in a new known node, trying to start a new search at a new node, and it goes and visits all the, or it checks all the adjacent vertices. If they are new, new territory, color is white, then it says we got to v by u, it's the parent, and then we recurse. And so of course this gives us the depth first property. So you can see that when this finishes, we will have visited every vertex in the graph by virtue of this thing. And since we're visiting, we're checking the adjacency list of every vertex in the graph, we will have checked every edge in the graph. And that leads immediately to the um, asymptotic analysis. So we're going to have theta of here. We've got checking uh, each vertex and checking each vertex again. Uh, so that's two times the size of set of vertices, which is, of course, theta of the size of set of vertices. So it's theta of v for that. Now here, it would be hard to figure out, well, how many things are on the adjacency list of each vertex? Well, we don't know. Uh, or you can make an assumption that, on average, it's going to be a uh, number of edges divided by the number of vertices on average. Uh, but there's no need to do that, because we have this thing called aggregate analysis, which we actually cover in the next, next week's screencast. I've reordered the chapters here, because we needed to cover graphs early. But the idea of aggregate analysis is if it's hard to know, if you can't count for every time we enter this for loop how many times it runs, because it runs different times depending on the data, well, then figure out some other way to count, which is count across all the loops rather than each loop. And in aggregate, we know that all of these adjacency list checks will eventually check every edge. And so that's where we get the E. And this is theta, not big O. With BFS, it was big O because it was possible that we wouldn't get to all the vertices. Here, we're guaranteed to get to all the vertices, so it is theta. Well, that concludes our introduction to depth first search, the algorithm, and its time analysis. Next, we need to look at a detailed example, which will motivate our discussion of some of the properties of depth first search. And we'll leave here. This is from uh, the uh, 2004 voyage. Uh, exploring in depth, we dropped a camera down that was 
held within a few meters of the bottom of the ocean as we cruised along and observed the kind of life that there was at night. Uh, this was actually done for ground truthing of satellite data to see if the satellites were inferring correctly what was underneath on the bottom of the ocean. And that's Scott Ferguson there at the controls.